afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii, April 26, 2021. And my guest today is the Energy and Sustainability Coordinator for the County of Kauai, the Honorable Ben Sullivan. And Ben, I'd like to start with a riddle. Mirror, mirror on the wall, which the U.S. is the greenest of them all. And my guess is the county of Kauai. And that's what, what, what I want to do is try to get the into the inside story of how you guys got so gosh darn green. You have this very, very enviable uh, track record. If every county in the U.S. of A had the track record that you had, our problems would all be over. We'd be a really, really clean and prosperous uh, county. So welcome, Glenn. Thank you so much for, welcome, Glenn. Ben, thank you so much for being my guest. And you have been the energy coordinator for a long time. And then they added sustainability to, to your title. So let me begin by asking, what has attracted so many renewable energy companies to Kauai? Do you guys slip them money under the table or something? Or what, what's going on here? How, how did Tesla get, uh, get to you? Or how did they discover you? And what, <laughs> what deal did you make? Sure, great question. And before I start, I want to I want to take advantage of the the faux pas and names that you gave, and just pay a little homage to you know those of us that have been doing this work for a lot longer than myself. So my predecessor Glenn Sato, I know, was a good friend of yours, Howard, and did this job for I think twenty some years himself, and and made a lot of great progress and did foundational work. And I was lucky to follow him up, and I'm still you know very happy to be doing this job. But but um, the answer to to how do we get so green, I think, is a lot of people doing a lot of hard work over a long period of time. Um, mm -hmm. And I will also say that I think that sometimes the grass is greener on the other side of the channel. So uh, we are very green. Part of that is all the rainfall we get. Part of that is our, our luck and our, and our hard work on renewable energy. But um, we, we, we still have plenty of challenges as well. So <laughs> lots to do over here. Mm -hmm. um, to answer your question, you know, I, think, I think there's several key pieces to look at when you look. And, and I think primarily you're, referencing the tremendous progress that PIUC has made over the years, probably above other things at the moment, right? Yeah. So as a lot of folks know, we have a utility cooperative, which is a very different structure on the island, and that allows for a lot um, greater and closer and local control of strategic decisions of the utility. Um, obviously, we were, like all the utilities in Hawaii for a long time, very dependent on diesel, and so it was very expensive. And uh, you had a, a locally driven utility board that back in 2007 said, hey, we're going we're gonna to make it to 50% renewable by 2023. And that was, at the time, their line in the sand. And as, as safe and easy as 50% renewable sounds today, that was very, very aggressive back then. Mm -hmm. So you could imagine people saying, how are we going to do that? That seems impossible. We need all these firm power resources and fossil generation to, to keep the lights on. Um, you know, the utility staff just took it on and took ownership of it and began to pursue. And at the same time, the, the price of PV and the price of batteries and the, you know, the R&D that went into all those things did what, they, did what it's supposed to do to the market. And AUC started getting better and better at installing renewables. And then you know, here we are uh, 10 years, 15 years later, and we're, we're staring down 80%. So, as of today, we're over 60% renewable energy. And I really feel like I'm doing a commercial for KIUC right now, but that's okay. <laughs> um, the Tesla plant and a lot of the firsts that you referred to are, I think, are um, evidence of the success of the utility. And I think when, when you get success like that, people want to jump on board. So you had Tesla wanting to deploy a large battery set to show that it could be done. And they saw a utility that had already done a lot of large scale solar farms, you know, uh, more so and probably uh, quicker than a lot of other utilities. So they were at the, you know, the leading edge of deploying solar and they said, hey, we want to get in on the action. So um, that Tesla plant, I think, is a, is a product of that. And also 
a product of you know the ability for the of the utility to deliver lower cost resources to the grid. So you know all these things, um, all these all these solar farms, all these resources that have gone on the grid have gotten less and less expensive and delivered more and more savings to mm -hmm. new Hawaii residents over the course of ten or fifteen years. Um, you know to the extent that. The, the most recent ones to go on the grid are on the, you know, in the range of about 10 cents. So um, AES has been a key partner and they, you know, their most recent um, PMRF solar farm, I think is, I think came in right around that 10 cent mark. So um, very, very affordable energy. Um, obviously that's just the avoided portion of it. So there's still, you know, the utility operational costs that get built into the final rate customer, but great things overall. Um, I don't want to, Go on too much. I'm sure you've got a lot of questions, but it's great to see you. I'm great to be great to be here and uh, happy to share all of all the wonderful things that are happening on the island. Yeah, you mentioned uh, operational costs. One of the gosh darned problems with fossil fuel energy, be it coal, oil, natural gas, is the fact that you just can't turn it on and have things go. You have to continually feed some sort of fuel into the power plant. And number one, that fuel ain't cheap at all. Number two, you've got a lot of moving parts. And generally speaking, the more moving parts you have, the higher the maintenance requirements. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, you know, I, I'm feeling like you should have asked Brad Rock, Rockwell to come on and, and do the show with us <laughs> because really he's got the, you know, he and KAC have a much more in-depth understanding of those issues. But I think you hit it pretty, pretty much on the, on the mark. Um, you know, I recall a point back in 2008 when, you know, I think all of us that have been in the energy space for a while recall oil prices went so high um, that our corresponding electricity price at that time went to 47 cents. Mm -hmm. So we actually had conversations with people who were shutting down their businesses because they couldn't afford electricity. So, you know, you, you hear all the reasons in the world why people struggle with business and, uh, you know, especially now in the pandemic, it's always a concern. What can we do to help businesses? But can you know? Can you imagine the primary reason being I can't afford to keep the lights on, literally? Mm -hmm. you know, and that's what happened. And so I think that was you know that was at the very front end at the very precipice of this transformation. We saw that acute pain. We realized we just could not expose ourselves to that kind of volatility, like you said. Yeah, that's oil was what one twenty a barrel, something like that. Can't recall exactly, but I think yeah, yeah I think it, it's it, it was over over a hundred. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. and I do remember that forty-seven cent it should have been broadcast uh, nationwide. Painful. So you mentioned costs coming down continually. What's behind this? Is cost of, of renewables now? What's behind cost coming down? What's going on here? Well, I mean, I think, again, you know, great question for KAC and as an observer, what I have seen, and, you know, I have a little bit of background with them. I spent, um, uh, I spent three years on the board of directors for KAC, so I have a general sense of how those things are going, but I want to just continue to give credit to them for that. And I think it was a combination of things, you know, it was one is they really learned how to execute projects better and better every time. One of the things that they did is if you look at the early uh, PV projects KAC deployed, they were um, PPAs where they're paying someone else to do, you know, everything, and then they just continue to pay that that entity for power over the course of the project. Um, they realized pretty early on that the that PV projects are very low risk; they're really just financial transactions, and so they they figured out how to capture the tax credits internal to cooperative um, by making LLCs that that were able to exhaust the the, the for profit tax credits, and then doing most of the work other than the EPC contractor in house. And so really, you know, driving the cost down and their approach has been, you know, unless there is some, some risk that requires outside expertise, such as with their biomass plant, then, then, you know, they would proceed on their own. So that's what they've done with PV. Um, and then you start to see um, outside contractors and PPAs coming back into play when they started incorporating more storage. Because again, there was, you know, early on with storage, there's a little bit less certainty as to how it's going to perform. And so let's let's bring in someone else and buy the power from them. And then let's leave it on them to decide or to worry about, you know, the life of the batteries and how the batteries are managed and all that kind of stuff. So um, I think, you know, KAC has just done an incredible job of executing and they've had a number of, of resources at their back. Certainly the county has tried to be as strong a partner as we could be. Um, 
one of the early things that happened, in, you know, in my tenure at the county is we we um, developed an MOU that basically pivoted the relationship between Kauai County and and the utility. Um, it was somewhat adversarial prior to that, where you know th there was a lot of prior to KUC making all the progress that they made, there was some political um, desire to kind of impose requirements on them and to get them to move faster. And that was not necessarily um, effective. It was kind of, you know, folks from the outside saying, hey, we need to move faster. So we're going to require this or that. None of that took any, you know, took, took any major effect. But but when we pivoted, um, and at the time it was uh, Mayor Carvalho that was leading, you know, the, the message was, hey, we, we're here to help. We want to figure out what you need, how we can help you. Um, how, do we, how do we help expedite permits? How do we help advocate for, for projects? How do we get out of your way so you can do what you want to do? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, uh, Mayor Kawakami actually served on the KUC board prior to myself. So if anybody knows the business and knows how to support a utility going forward, you know, you know Mayor Kawakami, who, who has been in office for a little over two years now, really understands those relationships and has been a huge boost, I think, to, to the cooperative in terms of being able to continue to just charge ahead and get the job done. So we're very excited about their progress. So based on your, oh, let's see, let's get some acronyms out of the way. Um, <laughs> K, K I U C and M O U, please. Sure. Sorry. Hawaii Island Utility Cooperative. And so that is mm -hmm. the name of our local utility, unlike the rest of the state. Um, under HECO companies, we, Hawaii, Hawaiian Electric companies, <laughs> we, uh, we have our own member owned utility here. And then MOU being Memorandum of Understanding. So just a really simple document that memorializes, um, you know, shared goals and vision for, for a lot of the projects and spaces that overlap. And we, you know, we derived as the county a lot of benefit out of that MOU and, and really it just kind of said, hey, we're going to be partners and do everything we can to help each other. Absolutely. I, I, uh, I've met both mayors and they have struck me as very cooperation oriented type uh, uh, guys. Sure. And I think this is a perfect example of you. You sound like you in the county are very much playing a support role to, uh, to KIUC, but aren't you up front with the permitting? You, you guys do all the permitting and everything, don't you? So obviously the, the, you know, the building division and the planning um, department have, you know, zoning and building requirements, but, you know, I, I think on a large scale utility um, system, you know, there's a lot of deference to the expertise within the utility. And, and I think there's also recognition that you know, there's multiple layers of regulation to, to assure safety and, and well-being. Um, and, you know, the stuff that we do typically as a county, and you know Doug Egg well, so, you know, again, more credit to him for this is, is, is life safety. And then also just kind of making sure that that things are being constructed to a standard, to, to, you know, to a reasonable minimum standard. Um, with with KAC and with large solar farms, that's you know a level of expertise that that our staff is not necessarily going to have for large power systems. And so you know you look at um, the fact that they are also regulated and and overseen by the Rural Utility Service and by FERC. So there's really um, right Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So there's you know there's plenty of um, checks in place to make sure that that things are done um, in the right way. And certainly, you know, the county has to, where appropriate, step back. And then obviously we're involved on the zoning side, you know, so the planning department is very careful to make sure that projects are put in the right place and they're, they're next to appropriate uses and all those kind of things. Um, it's also fair to point out that, you know, I think um, we have a lot of advantages over here that have allowed us to, to accelerate um, on renewable energy and solar in particular. You know, certainly one of them is being a more rural environment. And so having a, a larger percentage of, of open land available for projects like this. <clears throat> now, certainly on Oahu, you're very much constrained in terms of land available. And the cost of that land is, is probably even higher than it is over here. So that's, that's a variable. Um, another thing KUC has been, been very, very fortunate to have over the course of, of decades is really access to low cost capital. So the ability to borrow money at a low, low interest rate um, as a function of being a rural utility cooperative. And, and um, that, has, you know, that has certainly been a, a key uh, driver in their ability to execute on, on photovoltaic. Yeah, that I did not know. Access to cheap money. That's a real, real, real dry, driver there. Just on a, a lighter note, you do need to maintain the solar farms to some extent. 
And part of that, I think, involves uh, weed growth all around the panels, because it's out in an, what used to be probably agricultural areas. Is it Kauai that grazes goats on the solar farm? <laughs> it's, it's KHC, yeah, they, they have sheep and some of their solar farm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they, you know, they've, they've, they've done a, tr a tremendous amount of work. Yeah. You know, I think one of the most exciting things, and I'd love to pivot a little bit, because I think, you know, I think that a lot of us recognize that they've done such a good job that it's now necessary for us to be taking on kind of a different direction in terms of where we see our renewable needs and our, and our uh, clean energy needs going. Sure. Well, let me, let me kind of close out of the KAC conversation with this, if I may, and just say, you know, their most recent project proposal, which they just signed um, a deal with, with AEC again to, to execute, is a pump storage hydro project on the west side of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And that will actually, that project will take us to over 80% renewable energy when, it, when it's done. And I think it's, a, I, don't, I don't remember the, the construction timeline, but it's a you know, few years in the future, let's say 2025. And please check the press release to get that right. But uh, you know, they, they, that project is moving forward. They've gotten through a lot of the hurdles. Um, what they're doing is they're, they're basically upgrading some of the existing reservoirs and, and ditch systems. And they are using a large solar farm to take, take water that runs downhill and pump it back uphill during the day when the sun is shining. And then, um, you know, flow the water down through a, a hydro turbine at night when they need it. And so it's, it's like a, a really big battery, but obviously that battery is, is, is stored energy in the, in the form of water at a higher elevation. Mm -hmm. So amazing work there um, continues. And then you know, I think an area that we talked early on about what's the progress in the different counties. And I think an area where we can really look to, to you folks on Oahu is, is the amazing progress that HECO has made on the um, electric vehicle side. You know, from our perspective, you look at you and say, hey, the same thing that you're saying about us and our leadership. You know, the, uh, I noticed three things that, that HECO companies have done, actually four. You know, they have, they've made a great effort to um, have an EV ready program. So basically EV ready infrastructure where they're willing to help put in everything other than the, the charger itself or uh, certain facilities to, to help make sure there's plenty of infrastructure out there. They've got a backbone of their own chargers, as you know, that's a, that's a pretty amazing thing. And then, you know, they've also got electric vehicle rates. So, you know, one of the things we'd love to see and we're just engaging KAUC on now is what are the rates within which that an electric vehicle driver, whether it's a small car or a bus or a bicycle, you know, charges um, when they plug into the grid? And that's a very important part of electrifying transportation. So mm -hmm. you're going to see it. The last thing, and if you remember, I said four, they have, Hiko has done an amazing job. And it's the first time I've seen this in the utility business, bringing people in from outside of the traditional utility sector to, to take on key functions. And to me, this sounds like a small detail, but it's really important. If you look at like Aki Marceau as an example, as somebody who they brought into electrification and transportation, and, and even your own Jun Chi, who used to be at the State Energy Office and brought Jun in to, to perform on some of that. Like really smart people, really great move because you, you all of a sudden change your perspective, right? You get a broader perspective than you would have had if you just elevated somebody from within the utility. And I think that shows really, really tremendous leadership. And, and you know, certainly I think, um, speaks to the progress they're making in that, in that part of the, the um, overall ecosystem. Well, let, let me give you a little update. That those are definitely words of wisdom. Did you know Alan Yonan when he was here? Yes, yes. He, he's the Absolutely. RPR guy, and he's uh -huh. con continually writing uh, press releases for us. Seems like we have almost a press release a day. I, I was talking to Alan last week about a press release. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're sitting down. Alan, as of today, Monday, is with Hawaiian Electric. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> they, they stole them away from us. Ouch. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's obviously a good thing that they're looking mm -hmm. broader for, for, for talent. But then if it's all looking at HS, HSEO, that's, you guys are going to have to get back on defense yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. And he's been eating, living, sleeping energy for. I think it was 10 or 11 years with us. So he certainly <laughs> knows the energy. Yeah. Sure, sure. That's, yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. it, so I was correct that we were actually going back and forth with him last week. And um, your office, you know, and Chris Yunker and, and Sage um, did, a, did great work in supporting Kauai along the term lines of electrification. So they got our, um, 
I'm going to get the name wrong, but our alternative fuel corridor designation approved with with uh, the federal mm -hmm. government. So we now are able to receive funds through um, the STIP funding, and that's an acronym I'll stumble on. State transportation. Uh, you know what? I'm going to leave it alone. <laughs> STIP. Somebody else is going to have to fill that one in. But mm -hmm. basically, it's a you know it's a way for us to receive federal funding and 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 now for high speed chargers. So some federal great work funding. happening. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there is any federal funding coming. Maybe a bit. Small joke. <laughs> I, I did catch that as a joke. I'm not. I'm, I'm not yeah. sure if everyone else did. You're so. You're so subdued about it. Well, the the answer to that is we've got literally billions coming into teeny little Hawaii for various energy projects, and some of those dollars are going to be directed towards uh, EV in infrastructure. That's great news. And, you know, what an incredible thing, right? So we've, we've done so much in terms of uh, clean electricity, green electricity, and, and now we, we have this opportunity to transition and, and really kind of encompass some of that in terms of um, transportation fuels and become even more independent. You know, that, you know that one of the things that's really interesting that I observe here on Kauai, Howard, is, um, and, and you got to give a lot of credit to our planning department, our council, um, no, Mayor was actually, Mayor Kyle Conway was on the council and critical to a lot of these things early on, but not just electrification of transportation, but also really shifting transportation in terms of mode choice. And so we've got some really smart people over here. I don't know if you've ever interfaced with Lee Steinmetz or Marie Williams or any of those guys, but from our planning department who have spent, you know, the last decade really hammering home the fact that we're going to get there in terms of cleaning up our transportation systems. There's a lot of reasons to do it. It's not just about clean energy. And, there, and the biggest opportunity is to help create mode choice, right? So it's like you guys are doing with rail, but whether it's transit or rail or bicycling or, or, or uh, walking, like we, that's the built environment. We gotta, we gotta be focused on that. It doesn't just happen on its own. And so, you know, one of, your, one of the things you're seeing behind me is our, my, in my, uh, my background is our little electric bike that we demoed but also a whole bunch of EV chargers. And then this, this little piece of the hui is actually a part of a much bigger um, Tiger Grant that was a transportation initiative that was about trying to generate economic recovery. That was as a function of the last you know, big recession in 2008. And what it did is it you know, built in mode choice. So more bike paths, more bike lanes, more sidewalks, more bus shelters, and the one you can see in the background there. So, you know, great stuff happening in that regard. And that's a long haul because it's infrastructure. It doesn't happen overnight. So I think if you thought the utility business was slow, you know, go look at the transportation system and it may be even slower, but we're going to get there. We're headed in the right direction. And the, and the folks who are doing the work are amazing. Uh, some, somehow the word uh, sustainability seems to creep in there. <laughs> yes, yes. What do you think about that? <laughs> now, why don't you describe your, the sustainable part of your job because you have two parts, two, two sure. types there. Yeah. Sure. So, as you noted um, with KUC, and that this is true for really all of the things we do, we, we provide support to different agencies when they are breaking new ground. So, so, in the case of KUC, we just try to figure out how we can be a good partner, how we can support what they're trying to do. In the case of the planning department, you know, we, we add support. In the case of Kauai Bus, as an example, we add support. We also add support for um, you know, our public works uh, solid waste division. And so you know, to, 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 to me, and I guess from my perspective as the energy and sustainability coordinator, what that really means is it just says, you know, we need to look at things as systems. We can't look at them in silos. And we need to recognize that, um, that this process of change is about getting better integration between all these different systems and really trying to um, you know, look at a future that doesn't doesn't deplete more resources than are than are required, and and or especially than are available, right? So we gotta get off the uh, the one way bandwagon we've been on that is represented by fossil fuels and by high consumerism, and really try to really try to get more of a circular economy going, get more renewable economy going, and all those things. And so wherever that pops up, you know, um, my role and my it's a small role, but it's just to ask and support other agencies. So. One example, solid waste division under mayor's directive recently uh, passed that styrofoam ban. And I think you saw those across mm -hmm. the state. So um, that's something Kauai County chose to do as well. And so we've, we've um, provided a supporting role for that. 
and we continue to do so. And then, you know, there's just many other instances. Um, Why Bus right now is looking at piloting electric buses. So we come in and we add resources to them. They know they're the ones who know that system best. And so we really come in and we say, how can we help you? What, what don't you know about doing this? And they, they, you know, in this case, they're kind of saying, hey, we don't really understand exactly how the grid and rates work. So let's talk about that. And what, what would it, what's it gonna cost us? And what about this, these batteries and how can we charge them? But what they do know is, hey, this is where the buses need to be. This is how many people are gonna be on them. This is what type of buses, you know, so they know their operations really well. And it's a matter of kind of integrating the different knowledge bases to get success. Mm-hmm. So to me, that's a big part of what sustainability is, but it's, you know, it's impossibly broad. I mean, you, you know, we could, could be talking about food systems or, or natural, you know, ecosystem health, and it would all fall under that vast umbrella of sustainability, which I get to work under, you know, in a small portion of. Yeah, it, um, the talk about buses brings to mind the fact that tourism is coming back to Hawaii now. And if you had a good bus system, of course, tourists want to tour the island and they could tour the island by bus if they wanted when, when it, because you, you only have a few roads, so wherever they yes. want. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's on point, Howard. That's very on point. So one of the things that um, that mayor has emphasized, and we had some great conversations recently with Hawaii Tourism Authority. I don't know if you're familiar with their DMAP process, which is the destination management area plans that they recently performed for all four counties. But those those that was a really comprehensive community-based process where they they talked about what is HTA's relationship to all these other things? So from, again, going back to sustainability, how do we integrate? We're not just about getting visitors on planes. We're about recognizing that we have a huge footprint in, in transportation. So we want to help clean transportation. We have, a huge, we have a huge footprint in terms of educating folks on culture, in terms of natural resource preservation, all these kind of things. And so it was really great to see um, HTA stepping up to the plate on that and, and you know, with, with John DeFries as, as their new leader. Just offering some tremendous insights as to where, um, where and how do we deal with the gorilla in the room, which is tourism. You know, it's not something we can ignore. It doesn't make sense to just ignore it and it's not there or, or wish that it went away because that would cause tremendous economic pain for so many people. But instead, yeah. how does it integrate with our vision, right? I mean, that's, the, that's, the, that's where we want to get. Absolutely. And that is a very positive note, too. Unfortunately, end on, but that's, uh, again, very positive. We keep talking about overload of tourism, but you, you're pointing to some uh, ways where tourists have much less of a, a carbon a footprint. And they Never mind the carbon footprint. It's the car footprint that I love to emphasize, Howard. Yeah, I mean, if you think footprint. about the physical space and impact, and then, you know, obviously the carbon and everything else of cars, mm-hmm. you know, that's most often, if you listen to, to locals talk about their, their problems with tourism, very often it's about the cars. It's traffic, it's parking, it's you know this or that. Yep. And if we, could, if we could deal with that through mode choice, if we could get more people on buses, more people walking, more people biking, that would have a really big impact. And it, w- it would reduce that pressure that we have from tourism without, without having to say, we're going to mandate some dramatically yep. less, yep. You know, smaller so, number of, of visitors. And on that very, very cheery note, that's, that's a good visionary note. Thank you so much, Ben Sullivan, Energy and Sustainability Coordinator for County of Hawaii. And Code Green Think Tech Hawaii must bid everybody fond adieu. Thank you so much for attending. See you later. <laughs>